The Tote and Pairs podcast is brought to you by Tote and Pairs, the full service agency that designs and markets products, services, and experiences for women. You can find out more about us online at totenpairs.com or on social at Tote and Pairs. You're listening to the Tote and Pairs podcast, where every other week we're bringing together industry experts, scholars, and creatives to explore how the many lenses a woman wears shapes her perspective. Tune in every other week for an intersectional perspective. I think that it's a well-worn statistic that women control more than 80% of the household purse string, uh, not to mention how many households where women are the head of the household. Um, And they don't, a lot of times people don't realize this applies to cars, this applies to computers, this applies to where you're going to invest your money. Uh, One of the ways I kind of make the point to people is I think a lot of people don't realize that almost half of NFL's fandom are women. I'm Amber Anderson, and on today's show, we're talking about women's influence with author, activist, and the co-founder and former COO of Blog Her Inc., Elisa Camerhorn page In 2005, three women, Lisa Stone, Jory Desjardins, and Elisa Camerhorn page put out a rallying cry. Traditional media has started taking notice of blogging as a valuable tool, and these women noticed that white men dominated the space. Stone, Desjardins, and Page saw an opportunity and sought other women who, like them, had something to say about it. From parenting to politics, they wanted women to have a more prominent place at the table. The vision was a platform designed for women, by women, that highlighted the diversity and complexity of their voices. The result was a window that gave onlookers a direct view into the hearts, minds, and incredible influence of a woman's perspective. Blog Her Inc. catapulted into an iconic brand and successful business. Their platform welcomed over 100 million unique visitors per month to their website, supported a network of 3,000 publishers and 12,000 social influencers, and generated more than $30 million in annual revenue. In 2014, the company was successfully acquired by She Knows Media, and the founders moved on to fight for social justice and equality in different places. I sat down with Blogger's former COO, Elisa Camerhart Page, to talk about Blogger's legacy, diversity and inclusion, and how influential a woman's perspective can be. In a world that seems laser focused on the next big thing, Page leads with inclusion. Her guiding principle is that innovation plus empathy is greater than innovation plus efficiency. And I couldn't agree with her more. Let's go ahead and dive right in. So where I want to start is really just back in the beginning when you and your two co-founders decided that there was missing voices and spaces um, for women in the blogging space. And so you decided to launch a conference, which ended up becoming a media platform called Blog Her. Can you tell me how that got started and take us back to those roots? Yeah, absolutely. It was the very beginning of 2005, and the online community space was really blogging and some online groups like Yahoo groups. Um, But what was happening is that the mainstream traditional media was starting to notice this phenomenon of blogging. And we noticed that the sources they were using, the people they were quoting, the examples they were using all looked quite a bit like all the people who were running traditional media. And to be blunt, they were quoting and sourcing and citing a lot of white guys. And we thought, this is a new media platform with no gatekeeping. Anybody can start a blog. Anybody can raise their voice. It would be a real shame if the same network and gatekeeper effect in traditional media got replicated in this new media. And so there was an overall kind of where are the women question going around, and we thought it really needed to die. And so we thought if we did this conference, it would be like any other tech or blogging conference, but all the experts and speakers would just happen to be women. And it wasn't women talking about being women. It was women talking about politics or business or marketing or writing or publishing or personal blogging and just happening to be women while they did so. And we were not a company when we did that first event. We were three women. We used our credit cards to reserve the space. We did it as a real labor of love. And it was only after that first conference that we sat down and said, oh, you know what? I think there's an opportunity here. We have a community of women who really want to connect with each other on a regular basis. They really want to get more exposure for their work and their writing. And there was this subset of women who asked, well, why 
why can't I make money doing this? What's the business model? Because I have found something I love and I think I'm pretty good at. And so we really formed Blog Her to try to answer that question about what's the business model for women who are out here writing their hearts out. Amazing. And one of the things that I love about um, what you did and the creative approach that you took is you highlighted the fact that women weren't just talking about parenting in pink, right? Women were <laughs> talking about, I think, the, to quote you, everything from parenting to politics and how diverse women are and how we wanted to have conversations and lead conversations in an array of spaces. Can you tell me a little bit more about kind of that venture to raise awareness of how women are not monolithic and that we are actually influencing in several spaces, not just the conversation, but also the purchases that are happening within our home? Yeah, you know, we didn't want to be another pink and purple silo on the web. We didn't want to be another homogenous a place on the web. And we wanted to show that women's voices and women's perspectives were going to change the course of history. Uh, and like any media outlet, by the way, politics is often the loss leader. Um, but they, and they do talk, every media outlet basically talks about lifestyle and other topics in order to generate more revenue to support their hard news, politics, and, and investigative journalism. So, you know, we were no different in that regard, but nobody was doing it from a, in the women's space, trying to talk about parenting and politics and finances and fashion and technology and career and, and every bit of being a woman. Uh, so I think that that was one area where we were really trying to differentiate ourselves. And we also thought when it came to the opportunity for companies, by talking to the women in our network, you were not just talking to your customer, your direct customer, you were talking to a customer who influenced tons of your other customers. So it was a really interesting tone and balance for them to strike, to know this was both customer relations, but also media relations. And that, that took some time for companies to really figure out. And I think companies are still working through it, especially when we get to the small and medium sized business space. You know, mm -hmm. we work a lot with tech companies. And one of the challenges we continuously see is they cannot wrap their head around the fact that women are making majority of the purchasing decisions. And again, it's not just making any purchasing decision, but they're making almost all of the purchasing decisions. So I can see how at a higher level, when you're talking about bigger businesses and brands, that they too are still struggling with that. Um, and in most cases, I think they might have the sophistication and the data and analytics and expertise and money to now have the market data to support it. But it's still a strain, it feels like, um, when you trickle down into the smaller businesses to understand just how influential women are. Well, absolutely. I think that it's a well-worn statistic that women control more than 80% of the household purse string, uh, not to mention how many households where women are the head of the household. Right. Um, and they don't, a lot of times people don't realize this applies to cars, this applies to computers, this applies to where you're going to invest your money. Uh, one of the ways I kind of make the point to people is I think a lot of people don't realize that almost half of NFL's fandom are women. Right. And um, so it's it's way outside the traditional gender stereotype of what women influence. They really influence and control most purchasing on on every kind of product. And they are a different audience than some companies are used to marketing to. But once you sort of make that leap, uh, I think it can make a real impact on a business and its marketing outcomes. Well, and another thing I think that you guys have done really, really well, and it speaks to not just the business side of the work at Blog Her and how you set up the business infrastructure, but just who you are and how you came into the business and who you have continued to be throughout this time, is just making sure diversity and inclusion and authenticity mm -hmm. are deep rooted in everything that you do. Um, prior to this um, interview, I watched tons of videos of you and I could see the passion and the same um, spirit come from the first video that I saw to the more recent ones and even the work that you've done recently with your book. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about where that comes from, this drive uh, for making sure that when you say inclusive and you say a space for women, you really mean all women? Right. And it's it's so important these days. And I think for any company who's not bought into the need for it now, just take a look at some of the demographic realities. Uh, and there is a need. I think back in 2005, Lisa Jory and I were pretty aware that we were three women in tech from the Bay Area. So could could very easily be perceived as not 
inclusive as being within a bubble um, and not really relating to the rest of womanhood across the country. So from the beginning, I think because we were so similar geographically and in our backgrounds, uh, we wanted to make sure we didn't fall into that trap. But I think also when you dig into um, things like identity, you know, my identity, I'm the first generation American. Both my parents were immigrants to this country. I have a variety of ethnic uh, mixes. Um, I have um, a lot going on in there that makes me feel a little betwixt and between sometimes and not sure how to identify myself versus how I represent to the world, which I think is probably more, I'm sort of a little bit ambiguous, but I think most people make assumptions about what I am. And, um, and that's always made me super conscious of the reality of how much there, how many of us there are that don't fall into a box. And especially because, you know, my family is, um, you know, a bit of a, across my extended family is a bit of a rainbow coalition. Um, so, so that was sort of a personal driver for it. But, but the thing is that, one thing we realized sort of early on is that it's got to be more than words. You've got to do more than talk about how you're going to be inclusive. For me, my personal mantra is that first you have to value what diversity brings to the table. I actually don't think everybody does. I think when you see conferences that put up mantles or, you know, all white people or companies that have no, you know, no diverse people in their leadership, I think it's because they're not really bought in that it would help them or make a difference. They, they may pay lip service to it, but it's not a deeply ingrained belief. But if you do believe it and the data shows you, you should believe it, then the next step is you have to be intentional about it, prioritize it, set goals, and be accountable when you don't achieve those goals. And I think that's really missing from a lot of ways that people try to institute diversity and inclusion is that they say they want it, but there nothing happens if they don't achieve it. No one's ever lost a job because their workforce didn't increase its diversity. Uh, and the third thing is, if you want it and you value it, Sometimes you need to ask for help to get it and you need to be willing to be humble. And I think it's hard for people because um, it's not atypical for your network to look a lot like you do. That's pretty typical. It doesn't um, say anything about you. If you need to go out and ask for help and venture into new communities and try to um, get support, it, I think a lot of people are afraid that if they ask for help getting more women it means they're saying they're sexist. Or if they ask for help getting more people of color, it means they're saying they're racist. And you just have to move forward whether you think people might think that about you or not. It's your job. You got to go get it done and, um, and find people who can help you and introduce you to new communities, introduce you to new artists and creators. Um, they are out there. And if you don't know them, it's just because you haven't tried to meet them yet. Well, you know, one of the things that we come across is the leader usually does understand the value. And especially, again, coming back from the larger brands where they have more data and they're being scrutinized a lot more. And going back to those smaller and medium sized companies, especially when you talk about tech startups that are on the move to grow, that they don't, uh, it's not that the business owners in our experience don't understand it, it's that as they start to add on more team members, they don't understand it. So you can mm -hmm. think like, well, we want to target all women. We don't want to just target women of color. We want to speak to everyone. And so we have to re-emphasize the notion that when you try to talk to everyone, you generally are talking to no one. Or you're talking to right. someone you've picked, right? That right. look like you or think like you because you're not being intentional and recognizing that it's okay to be different and that people think differently and people have different needs. And as a brand, you need to speak to their needs, not yours. Right. I mean, I think it's such a fundamental marketing lesson that you just said. If you try to speak to everyone, you speak to no one, but people don't, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that in the context of diversity and inclusion before. And I think it's a really smart thing. Um, you can say you're for all women, you can say you're for all people, but until you segment and realize that um, certain segments of your market want to be spoken to um, in different ways from one another, they are, they all have 
different, different people have different reasons for using a product or service. And you would never assume that it was one feature set that was all you needed to talk about. You kind of recognize your customers have different needs. You create personas. Um, this is a common marketing thing as well, but I don't think people really extend that thinking to diversity and inclusion. And I think they should. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think one of the things that was so popular about the work that you were doing is that you were doing essentially influencer marketing before it was called influencer marketing, which yeah. how we can see is one of the values of bringing in influencers is that they already understand the audience. They have the voice and tone. And in many cases, they're bringing along an audience with them mm -hmm. um, that allows you to now tap into their expertise. Do we think you're going to be an expert in all different demographics for all of your customers, you know, no, but do we expect you to respect and understand them? Yes. See the value, like you mentioned? Yes. And then I love you saying, reach out for help so that you can get the exposure and the experience that you need to touch those customers in the right way. And right. You guys have been doing that for years. One of the leaders in the industry. Yeah. I mean, it certainly wasn't called influencer marketing for a while. Um, and it really had to evolve. You know, we, as I said, when we started, it was just people on their blogs and then it began to include all of these social media tools. And so the space really, really changed. And again, uh, I used to do a lot of research about how women were using the internet and how they were using these social tools. And I would go present it to customers. And the point I always made is that people's mindset it may be the same person using Facebook versus using Instagram versus writing in their blog versus using Twitter, but their mindset and how they want to hear from you and what they want to hear may be different depending on where you're capturing them. I really don't, you know, like that spray and pray, I'm going to create one piece of content or one message. I'm going to use it in the same way in every platform is is a recipe for really missing the mark for some people. Um, every platform has its own, basically its own culture that you want to try and integrate with. And you want to you want to join conversations. You don't want to interrupt them. And that looks different in the different platforms. Well, and I've also heard you speak about diversity being more than just color, right? But actually thinking about age and sexual oh, yeah. and how far um, all of the above, yeah. Yeah, and then people where they are in their journey. So as you speak about, you know, again, the platforms, but also what am I thinking about when I have my five-year-old next to me versus mm -hmm. when I'm at work on LinkedIn are completely different. Um, and I love raising awareness of how you have to be mindful of that and where the spaces are that you're connecting with them through their platform. So excellent feedback. So, you know, I guess what I would say right now is tell me a little bit more about some of the biggest mistakes you see brands have made in the past. Uh, first, you know, your experience in the past working with Blogger, but now, even now, as you're consulting, what are the challenges that you're continuously having to help people get over? Yeah, so I think number one is people think they have to be on every platform equally. And so what they do is they create one thing that they share equally. And I think brands could be a lot more strategic about how they engage in each platform, both to be more efficient, but also to put better content in each place. So that's number one. I think number two is trying to talk to everybody like they're all the same um, and not really targeting their message um, and not consulting. You know, when I see brands have snafus around either racially insensitive or um, gender kind of people pushing back on the gender norms they're using. And I'm like, who is in the room when they made these decisions? Was there anybody to right. say, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Um, so that's, I think, number two. And I think number three is that, and this is one of the consulting areas of focus I have, is I think people really think that people are create culture in a company and the systems and processes and mechanisms you use to communicate and collaborate come out of that culture. And so if you ask why a system or a process is the way it is, well, that's really a cultural thing. And so companies think if they just change the people, uh, you know, in other words, hire more diverse people, it will just automatically change the culture, which will change how we do things and everything's going to be awesome. But that's, that's not how it works, right? Because systems and processes and mechanisms and the way we've always done things 
also goes upstream and it influences the culture. And sometimes it can support the culture you want, or sometimes it can actually harm the culture you want. And so you can change the people, but not really change the culture and environment because of how you do things. And so it's not just a hiring issue when it comes to diversity and inclusion, it's a retention issue. And it's, it's an issue of how do you get folks to come on board and stay on board and really feel a part of a team. And are you doing things? Is the way you do things helping you with that? Or is it actually, unbeknownst to you, creating a barrier? And I find that a lot, not just around diversity and inclusion, but about remote workers versus office workers um, and people in different life stages or generations. Um, I find like, you know, not every person has the same work style, not every person has the same communication style. And a lot of times our systems don't accommodate for any of these things. They don't accommodate for different backgrounds, different communication styles, different work styles. And they really try to, and then when someone says, oh, it doesn't seem like there'll be a good culture fit for the organization, it just makes that, that all the more suspect. Because who's saying your culture fit is the one you should be so concerned about staying within? Hmm. Well, you know, a lot of times what I end up having to do is, um, you know, push back on people when they ask questions. So, for example, people will say things like, I just need somebody who can do a website. And it's like, well, maybe we should ask who the website's for so that you can find the right resource that can develop a site around that audience. Mm -hmm. And one of the conversations that's popped up recently is about hiring. And again, I think it comes back to understanding both your customers as well as your employees. And um, there was a peer of mine that was trying to contemplate between two different hires. One was a younger woman and then one was an older woman. And her team is all young. And so the challenge she was running is whether or not this older woman would fit into their culture. Uh, but the business that she runs the, the market is going to be older demographic. And so it never came to grips to her to think about the idea that maybe having someone on the team that could relate to your customers would be a beneficial thing instead of worrying about a culture that you've already created based off of, again, like you said, your network, right? That's such a great example. I always say, you know, when you start wondering why, if you have a consumer product particularly, and you start wondering why diversity matters, just consider that, consider the demographics of this country, consider the fact that African American digital users are early adopters. They're always the first out of the gate to use stuff. LGBT users, when they find a brand that really speaks to them and acknowledges them, they're incredibly brand loyal. And women, of course, as we said, control so much of the purse strings. Um, there's so many reasons that all of these different groups of folks are valuable. And I don't know any company that can really just say, I just don't care about 50% of my prospective clients. Right. You know, it's just not good business to say you're not going to try and do as much as you can to appeal to these large groups of people. Well, so one thing that I would say then is, you know, again, I think one of the ways that you've done it and certainly your experiences have shown in the businesses that you created is that being authentic is one way to do that. Right. Being sure. able to tell a story and be true to your story and your mission and your values. Even when I was inviting you on, you said, you know, I'm aligned with my mission. Right. And so, you know, that resonates, I, I think, very much so when brands are coming up and thinking about who their target audience is, is to make sure that that audience aligns. Can you tell me what your top tips are for brands that are looking to connect specifically with women in more authentic ways? What should they be doing today? Well, I think the number one thing any brand should do when they really want to make inroads with a community is listen and find the places where you can listen. Uh, one of the hardest things to do on social media is decide when you're not going to chime in, when you're going to let people talk about your brand and learn and listen and not feel the need to defend yourself, not feel the need to try and make, sometimes people just want to express their feelings. They don't actually want you to chime in. And it's a little big brothery like, to know that you're always watching. Um, people want some sense of privacy, even in these public digital conversations. So learn to listen. Um, and that to me is always the number one, because until you listen to your customer, you don't really know what you, they want, you know, what you want them to want. Uh, so that's step number one. Uh, I think step number two is to let people speak for themselves and, and highlight and feature and celebrate 
If you have a customer who loves you and is willing to talk about you, like that is uh, feature them, share what they're saying, give them some love. Uh, don't, don't be stingy with your link love. Don't be stingy with your social shares. Like, don't make it about you talking, just, just share what they're saying. Because especially for women influencers, um, you know, they want to be heard and seen. But the third thing is, if you want to work with influencers in any demographic space, um, pay them, you know, because you can get, there's some things that are just earned. People are talking about you and, and listening to them and sharing what they say is great. But if you really want to, to achieve marketing goals, then you have a budget line item like you would for any other marketing service. Um, and, and, you know, it's a really old tropey thing to say, but you know, people can't pay their mortgage with exposure. So if you really want something specific and helpful from influencers, pay them. Yeah. I mean, the data is there. And so there's yeah. so much now where it's, it's not about a lack of understanding, a lack of data. It's really about, I think the businesses and the brands doing the work to make sure that they check any biases they have on themselves yep. and within their teams so they can yep. move their business forward, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that be diversity and inclusion or understanding, you know, exactly what's happening in the landscape of influencer marketing. Um, yep. You know, it's all there for you. Totally agree. So at least it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your wits. Oh, thank you so much, Amber. It was great talking to you. I'm Amber Anderson. Thanks again for listening to the Toten Bears podcast. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to bring you a fresh perspective on women. In the meantime, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel inclined to do so, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review or send us an email at hi at totenpairs.com or catch us on social at Toten Pairs across the internet.